Hi, everyone, and welcome to Witch Hunt. I'm Josh Hutchinson. And I'm Sarah Jack. Joining us to discuss legal perceptions of witch hunting in India are two distinguished guests who bring a wealth of knowledge and experience to this topic. Our first guest is Ria A. Singh, a third-year law student specializing in human rights and environmental law. Ria has been deeply involved in researching human rights issues and has a particular focus on the legal framework surrounding witch hunting in India. And we're also honored to have Dr. Amit Anand with us. He's an assistant professor of law at Riva University and has recently completed his PhD with a focus on violence against women, including the critical issue of witch hunting. His insights into the legal challenges and societal impacts of this practice are invaluable. In today's episode, we'll explore the historical and legal context of witch hunting in India, discuss the public perceptions that fuel it, and examine the profound impact on victims. We'll also talk about the need for comprehensive legislation and the role of civil society and government in combating this issue. This is a complex and urgent topic, and we're grateful to have Ria and Amit here to shed light on it. So without further ado, let's dive into our conversation about the legal perceptions of witch hunting in India. Welcome to Witch Hunt, everybody. Hi, Josh. Hi, Sarah. Today we have Ria Arya Singh and Dr. Amit Anand back today. How are you guys? Very good, Sarah. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's it's very good to be back here, and thank you again for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for coming back. And Ria, what would you like people to know about your background and studies? Right. So, Josh, I'm a third-year law student, and I'm currently pursuing a five-year undergraduate degree of BA LLB. So for now, I have done a lot of human rights-related research work because that is what I have been exposed to throughout the years of law school so far. And as we go, I have done a lot of research work in environmental law, a lot of human rights. Dr. Amit has been a mentor of mine, and most of my research so far in human rights has been with him and Dr. Kangsha Madan. So yes, my interests also range towards corporate litigation, but so far, I think... This has been something that I have not been able to put behind me, put on the back burner. I think human rights is something that I'm interested in for the long term. And Dr. Anand, you've been on this podcast before, but for those people tuning in for the first time, could you give us a brief background? Well, yes. So, uh, hello everyone. I am I'm Dr. Amit Anand. As, as Josh mentioned, I've been here. Uh, before uh, this is this is the third time that I'm on the on the podcast, and I'm currently working as an assistant professor of law at the School of Legal Studies, Reva University, Bangalore, India. Uh, I have very recently finished my PhD in law. Uh, the topic of my research was violence against women in India, and uh, witch hunting in India was uh, a very crucial part of that PhD topic. We also hold an LLM in human rights, and uh, that really was uh, the in some ways, the backbone for later on going and doing a PhD, uh, which was very much focused on human rights. So my larger interest area is human rights. Uh, within that realm, I focus especially on, on gender discrimination uh, and uh, gender-based violence. Uh, and, and these are the areas around which I also teach here in the law school. So yeah, that's like, very briefly about me. Today, we're going to talk about the context of the legal understanding of witchcraft beliefs in India. Why is that a special area of interest for you? Right. So what first interested me when it comes to witchcraft legislation as a whole was when I noticed that in India, we have two types of laws. So we have laws against, you know, that criminalizes witchcraft. And then we have laws that criminalizes witch hunts which when I first came across it, I found a bit confusing, right? And I discussed it with my peers and we came to a sort of discussion that, hey, this looks like a cycle. Um, so what really interests me is that we don't have a central legislation for witchcraft, but we undeniably have cases on cases, several of them, uh, gory in detail, very violent on witchcraft, dealing with witchcraft. And those are only the reported ones. So this is a very 
urgent topic that we're talking about, these are not these are not cases that have reduced um, that we did observe a significant dip during the COVID pandemic era, but these are not cases that have reduced in frequency over the years as one would expect. So witchcraft legislation really is important. And the fact that only a few states have it, despite the cases that we deal with are spread all over different states in India, is pretty relevant and I think uh, important to discuss. And what is your impression of how the general population perceives witch hunting and the law? Right. So we can look at it in a twofold sense, right? Which is how people would normally approach this. So we have rural India and we have urban India. Now, Odisha is one of the main states that has a witchcraft legislation that has done extensive work on the topic, right? So in my research here, I have come across several people who have been instrumental in actually combating this, combating witchcraft as a whole. Uh, one of them is Minati Behra, who's a chairperson for the Odisha State Commission for Women. But their work and all of that is pretty much not known to the public. When we look at it, uh, especially in the city I live in, right, Bangalore, India, we don't have cases of witchcraft or witch hunting that we know about so, you know, so loudly. It's not, it is not a topic that we are exposed to, right? But superstitious belief, right? Before we discuss this, I think it's important we remember that we're, what we're dealing with here is a petri dish of hope juxtaposed with fear and then underscored with desire, right? Want of a higher status, of a financial gain of sorts. And we're all, to, a, to some extent, vulnerable to this, right? And public perception when it comes to it, people shy away from discussing witchcraft as a whole all over India, I'm sure. Be it any urban India or rural India, it is not something that is discussed openly. It is it is somewhat of an odd topic because you never know uh, what a person is addressing when they say witchcraft or witch hunting, right? And as I researched for this over the past few weeks, I realized that, right, I'm talking to my friends about it, I'm talking to their parents about it, right, who are from Jharkhand, who are from Odisha. And they have a they have very skewed perspectives on the same, right? So we'll start with something smaller, right? It's a step back from witchcraft, superstition, just in general. When you get lower marks on a test, or when there's a straight A kid who has suddenly fallen into you know a bad crowd, who has friends that are encouraging them to do bad things, perhaps, right? Their parents will often say, "Oh, it's nazar," or uh, "drishti." Right now, the English translation for that would be "evil eye." Right, so that is that is something that is prevalent in urban and rural India. Right, this is just a bit of a superstitious belief that I'm discussing here. But I think the scientific temper that we are trying to inculcate all over India through education or so on is something that does not always work retrospectively. Right, these are beliefs that were born with. These are beliefs that were raised with. What we fail to realize is that our thoughts can impact us before we have a chance to analyze them. And I think for me, that has been very interesting. I spoke to a friend about it who is from Odisha, which is what I began this discussion with. She told me that she lives in Bhubaneswar, right? Urban Odisha. But they have lots of people from eastern states, right? Neighboring states of Odisha. And it is not so much as, oh, this person is definitely practicing witchcraft, but the fear remains with the family. The fear of it is very compelling, right? So, of course, the rural perception of it is often linked with, um, is often linked with crop failures or a, a single woman, a widowed woman having property, right? Or children that are born to these, you know, women out of wedlock. The stigma sort of carries its way through the lack of resources, the lack of infrastructure, and so on. But public perception is to shy away from the topic in general. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll just add uh, a very small point to what Ria said. Uh, and and uh, this is again related to uh, 
not only the legal understanding, but uh, mostly uh, in relation to uh, the ignorance at uh, not only at the community level, but a state level and national level when it comes to why do not we have uh, strict laws or a law that, that covers the entire nation. So, uh, I mean, obviously, this is something that, that I, I found while I was doing the PhD. And this is, again, related to not only the ignorance towards understanding gender-based violence, which in some ways has added to the ignorance of uh, treating witchcraft accusations as a form of gender-based violence. So what I, uh, when I was trying to understand why witchcraft accusations happen and why uh, all of this is uh, still very much not considered to be a mainstream topic when it comes to gender-based violence is, is obviously the, the whole superstition, uh, the whole uh, concept of even I and all of that is there. But a large part of this is also about ignoring the reality that's on the ground. So by not treating this particular form of violence as gender-based violence, what has happened is that there is, like how Ria rightly pointed out, that uh, people are hesitant or they, they rather ignore uh, instances of, of witchcraft uh, or witchcraft accusations that, although at a very minor scale, uh, do often get reported in national newspapers every now and then. But then again, uh, these are your regional newspapers in, in regional languages, not uh, not in national languages. Oh, sorry, not national newspapers in English. So a very few people get to know about these things, even if it's being reported by a newspaper that comes out from the same state where it's happening. So it's, again, it's not on the front page. It's tucked away on page 10, 11, somewhere in a very small section, just a few uh, you know, sentences about uh, something like this has happened and, and never a follow-up report as to who the victim was, what exactly happened, was there any justice at the end. So again, this whole ties in to the point about uh, people being ignorant and then not treating this as uh, something that should be treated as gender-based violence. So again, the, the whole question then comes around understanding what gender-based violence is. And this is uh, this is, and, and the last part of thinking is that uh, it, this gender-based violence is just it's just limited to you know uh, to domestic affairs or uh, things that happen in the marital home, and, and that that ends the matter. But people often do forget that this gender-based violence, like similar to the understanding of gender, is evolving as we speak. And if we have a holistic approach towards understanding gender-based violence, then perhaps we'll find ourselves in a position to uh, then include so many practices. They might be coming out of you know, religious beliefs or superstition or any other factor, but they are then harming a significant portion of the population based on, you know, on just on their gender. So, so this, I, I took this particular route while I was doing the PhD and then the work that I did after that as well that it comes down to the understanding of what gender is and then what gender-based violence is. And then again, not just gender-based violence within the larger global discourse, but this could mean different things regionally as well. So in the Indian subcontinent, this could mean very different things than perhaps how gender-based violence is seen in Europe or elsewhere. So this, this whole, this again, and this, this is not, a very significant part of the discussion on witchcraft accusations. But again, without this, it, it becomes like the whole story is in, in some ways incomplete. So just that point about ignoring what this is and perhaps that's at the root cause of not having a significant, you know, larger legislation which is strict and the implementation of which is, is very real on the ground, which is lacking today in India. What laws currently exist to combat the witch hunting and witch branding? When we come to examine the bare bones of the law, Bihar and Jharkhand were the two first states that came out with legislation on witchcraft. So Bihar's was called Prevention of Witch Practices Act 1999. Now, as Dr. Amit said, this was essentially to protect women, right? So the first ever witchcraft legislation was made with this intention of protecting women 
to eliminate women's torture, humiliation, and killing by the society. This is verbatim what the act says. And even Jharkhand came out with its own law in 2001 after this. So 1999 was when Bihar came out with it, then Jharkhand. Then we had Chhattisgarh in 2005, which is, uh, which is another law. Around 1,500 police cases were reported in the state and over 90% of the women were either widows or women separated from husbands or women with no children. Right, So it is very much a gendered issue. But however, I did come across a few cases, a handful of cases that did target men. So there was a case in 2011 in which a man was ostracized based on based off of caste differences and he was buried alive, branded a witch, buried alive. And there are cases like that. So one of my favorite uh, legislations I came across was the one in Karnataka. Now, this does not verbatim say, oh, this is for witch hunt. This this legislation in Karnataka says that it it is against evil and sinister practices and to combat and eradicate other inhuman evil sinister practices. Right? It is considered necessary to create a healthy and very social safe environment, a very socially safe environment. And this is especially for women, but it encompasses all people in it. Now, Rajasthan, Odisha and Assam are a few other states, but we don't have central legislation. So Maharashtra and Karnataka do address superstitious beliefs and criminalize ma black magic. And black magic is, again, the occult, right? Occult practices. But they do not mention witchcraft in particular. The state of Odisha, I'd like to repeat, has done several sort of outreach programs, has, has this report that was released uh, in collaboration with Action Aid, I believe. And in their recommendations under civil society is what we can do. A major portion of it was to address the intersectionality of the issue, right? So to link the fact that witchcraft, witch branding, uh, these practices are essentially linked to gender. So women are women face the major brunt of this, and not just gender, but they, but also the patriarchy. So it was something that the report came out with, saying that right, the civil society organizations need to link this issue with the patriarchy, and that was one of the recommendations. I do believe. Now, when it comes to central legislation, we can go in depth uh, further. But the most recent was a bill that was introduced in the Rajya Sabha on in 2022 9th december and it was uh, by the M the member of parliament of odisha sajit kumar and let me just find the name for it right so in the list of business on friday december 9 2022 shri sujit kumar mp from odisha moved for leave to introduce the bill to provide for effective measures to prevent prohibit and protect persons especially women from witch branding and hunting to eliminate their torture, oppression, humiliation, killing, sexual assault, stigmatization, discrimination, ostracization by providing punishment for such offenses, relief and rehabilitation of victims of such offenses, and for matters connected therewith or incidental thereto. Now, this is the one in 2022, right? Now, there's one thing in particular. Most of these criminal acts that are committed, most of the criminal acts that are committed in the name of witchcraft or witch hunting, they are all addressed to some extent in the IPC, in the evidence, in the criminal procedure code. All of these, the three in, in our criminal laws in India. But what happens is, in, in a recent case, we saw that the charge sheet, right, which is when you're framing the charges of these crimes that have been committed in the case, it, was, it amounted to 1,600 pages long. And it was something that was filed, that was filed 89 days after the arrest was made in the case, right? Now, of course, we have, we clearly have acts that penalize these crimes, right? In our, in our Indian Penal Code 1860, we have these. But what we don't have are laws that take care of the relief and rehabilitation of the victims of such offenses. And without substantive evidence, these cases fly under the radar. All of these people are not convicted. The case is just, just gone away. So a specific legislation and why a specific witchcraft legislation is required in each state essentially relies on the fact that we need something that is more holistic in its approach. 
not just about criminal criminalizing the crimes that have been committed right so which branding which hunting are lead to ostracization right lead to a lack of education for the families of those that are ostracized so several cases are heart wrenching if you if you go into details of them uh they have been and they they occur in rural communities where the people have nowhere to turn to they have they are surviving in forests living off of sewage water their kids do not have access to education in in such scenarios what happens is right so we have laws in odisha we have laws in karnataka to an extent but what we don't have are laws in other states where such crimes have been detected or at least have been reported as crimes of witchcraft because they are, the evidence is so strong like kerala we had a case in ernakulam in which there, there was a there was a double homicide right a couple months apart uh it first came to light because a woman was kidnapped so a missing persons report was filed the woman was from tamil nadu which is another state without witchcraft laws she was lured in with the promise of 10 lakh rupees i believe of right you come here you will get 10 lakh rupees something to do with buying lottery tickets and there were atrocities committed in the name of witchcraft so the main accused was a man who was propagating himself as a sort of witch doctor who promised this couple uh, a husband and wife that they if they carried on his instructions that they would you know find themselves wealthy and uh, better in society better status in society and so on but what happened is the police investigated it and it they found out that the main accused had not only uh, sort of committed these two murders right by instigating the couple but was also planning more now this would have never come to light if the if the person was in court right but now we have proper strong evidence because they have confessed that yes this was in furtherance of our which you know our acts for witchcraft our uh, we that we cut the body up into 56 pieces buried it that there, there are several heinous details and they are undeniably part of witchcraft acts but the the law is not present in that state it was in fact it was initiated but what happened was the kerala high court denied the petition because from the side of the petitioner the representation was absent on several counts so why i mentioned uh, miss behra earlier who is chairperson of the ocws was because we need people in power to really follow this through we need civil society members to really follow through on pushing these laws not just as bills but until they are laws and then further into action right essentially we do not have a central legislation we can go into that further uh when there's question but when it comes to state laws we only have them in the states i have mentioned and we have people that are introducing bills on a national level the 2022 bill there was a 2016 bill that did not uh, make it through the rounds of parliament but we have been seeing progress when it comes to people keeping keeping momentum in a way but it is all it is all under the radar until the bill does become a law is signed into the law so that is what i have well yes uh, also also just to add a small point to what priya just said uh, very recently uh, uh, i i don't believe this is the latest data from the government but uh, i just very recently found out that the year in the the national crime records bureau which is the nodal agency for uh, reporting crimes several categories of crime all over the country in 2022 what they did was uh, they came up with data with respect to witchcraft accusations and killings in the name of witch hunting in three to four states in india and and these were the states that had uh, their own specific laws on witch hunting but the data did show that in in that year 2022 there were about 100 reported cases that the government knew of uh, and uh, out of these 100 cases uh, these four states significantly contributed up to 80% so 80 of those cases came from these states that had laws uh, relating to uh, witchcraft accusations and uh, these were also the states that had been doing some kind of transformative work at least on the ground in terms of reaching out to people and telling communities about 
uh, that this is something that's against the law, you shouldn't be doing it. But then again, I, this data then really proves the point that there is so much more for the, for the government to still do in terms of transforming the mindset and actually making sure that whatever it is in the current form, especially in these states, in the form of the law, is actually then workable or uh, is made sure that, at least make sure that it works smoothly on the ground and people are aware and at least survivors of of these uh, witchcraft accusations and when violence does happen and obviously most times uh, the victims don't survive, but at least for the ones who do survive, uh, they have a recourse to justice uh, by availing themselves the benefit of the law. But then, you know, it, it's another, it's another, big task to, to actually explain to people, explain to these communities that whatever it is that they believe or whatever the reason is behind, you know, for them to act in such manner or in, in some ways when the branding of a witch happens and what exactly goes through the minds of these people who do that is, is something that's any given day is a violation of human rights of that particular person against whom this is happening. So you you need to break several barriers before you see the day when, you know, the law is actually working on the ground. And again, this again, we should also understand that the law in its current form is not very perfect. So if you look at some of the legislations that these states have, they don't have very strict punishments. And uh, uh, even if they make the law, they don't necessarily pass the rules for the bureaucracy to then actually implement the law on the ground. So that's another difference. Again, uh, passing the law is one thing, but then you should also be making sure that people are aware of such legislation because these are special legislations. They are not general legislations because they have a special category attached to them. The government then again, and the civil society and everyone, uh, academics and researchers and everyone, there needs to do that much of the hard work to make sure that these special legislations are, are not just there on paper, but actually are there uh, working on the ground. So again, uh, we should also keep in mind that the data that the government has is not always reliable because not every case does get reported. So if in 2022, the government is saying that there were only 100 reported cases on witchcraft accusations in four states in India, the real data might be much, much more. So, and uh, it was not long back that the government actually dedicated uh, its nodal agency to actively look at witchcraft data. So for a long period of time, they were not doing it. When very recently, I think in the last five to seven years, they have been doing this. So that again, gives a very clear picture as to how serious this was for the government to actually look into it. So in the last say seven to ten years they have been gathering data but then a lot of people or at least activists who have been working on the ground who have been talking to victims they know that the data by the government isn't the real one well this is again uh, something that we should also always keep in mind and are there other factors into why these are not being effective I think it's safe to say that the laws that do exist, the state legislations on witchcraft, they do have punishments, They, but the punishments, again, would probably be a maximum of 5,000 rupees. They all vary right across the states, which is another reason we need a central legislation. There are inconsistencies amongst the state laws. And again, different state laws have different uh, definitions of what they're punishing. It's another thing. The recent, again, the one I mentioned, the 2022 bill on witchcraft, which is a proposed central bill, has punishments, has penalties up to 10 lakh rupees, uh, seven years imprisonment, right? So there is a pass that is being made for that. But a main reason why it's uh, failing, per se, is because there's no, there's no follow-up being done on a priority basis. If if these if uh, the case is mentioned is reported as a case of witchcraft, they are it's not followed through. The victims are losing far more uh, by reporting the case than by actually staying 
you know complicit in it if they if they report it they're still ostracized right the rehabilitation uh, sort of the rehabilitation mechanism is mostly through women and children uh, commissions through women and children departments that exist in different states and this is and they remain a problem even just for uh, the vulnerable women groups so we have hostels for women working women we have several programs by the government to uplift women uh, rural women urban women women who are vulnerable with you know who require a place to stay uh, looking for their jobs careers so government has several schemes but they remain insufficient just to sort of be sufficient for the women they remain insufficient in addressing the need for normal requirements in general and when you add the intersectionality of women and children that have suffered such a crime right it adds on to the difficulty of application so we need we need special committees to deal with witch hunting cases we need members uh, retired teachers we need uh, there was something in the report that address this we need free legal aid to the victim immediate protection and support to the survivors family members right but i think essentially the reason is not really translating to awareness when we get what we expect from a law what we expect from a legislation is because uh, of i guess we could say cultural relativism really steps in here because these are traditions these are customs you trust the witch doctor you trust uh, when you see some positive cases of addressed right this this person was cured so there are these positive cases that uh, reinstate that belief in people so we need the involvement of traditional leaders of these uh, tribal communities we need the jati samaj which is jati again could translate to tribe samaj is society so jati samaj the tribal society Uh, we need their support a collective decision of sorts to help bring these resolutions against witch branding right and until until we have a firm faith in the law right until we can build that faith amongst people that no you will be rehabilitated right of the cases that are reported that you will have justice it is difficult for people to really follow through with their report follow through with their case but as dr amit pointed out right now with the legislations that we do have the penalties are far less and most of the cases are reported under the ipc and without substantive evidence nothing can go forward because the person is this, is innocent until proven guilty and the cases can drag on for years in litigation yeah i'll also i'll also add a, a very small point of this now when it comes to the question about uh what are the, some of the significant barriers when it comes to uh, the implementation of the law i'll say that uh, because this is not something that the law can and this is what i believe that the law can very uh, you know uh, very actively tackle on this is not something like a like a problem in the language or in the law per se which could be corrected or which could be amended this is more of a social problem so even if i mean when we look at the legislations that do exist uh, as we, as we are speaking uh very few of them are actively trying to deal with uh, defining terms like witchcraft or witch hunting or who is a witch doctor or what kind of different harms uh, a victim would essentially go through so if, if we look at the definition if you are trying to define something uh, like what is the definition of the term harm does that only include physical sexual harm does it not include mental or economic harm or does it not include harm to dignity and reputation because branding somebody as a witch obviously then tarnishes their reputation for you know for their entire life and if we look at uh, if you're trying to define the term witchcraft then then we are definitely dealing with uh, other terms like evil power or black ma- magic or evil eye or any other power that you know uh, that people say that they they have this power to call upon spirits and cast spells or perhaps indulge in similar practices so then what are these things uh, if i've said in a breath all these different terms and what do they actually mean do they mean the same thing for everyone that's going to be uh, put under the law or does it mean different things if if they are meaning different things 
then uh, which one's the correct one and which one do we then leave out? So what is black magic for the purposes of witchcraft? And what's black magic that's outside perhaps the purview of witchcraft? Is there like good black magic? Is there like always a bad black magic? So, and again, what's at the root cause of these things? Is, is there just, you know, uh, traditional practices, traditional belief system? Is that is religion having any say in this? If religion is having any say in this, and that too, in a country like ours, then then we do have a very huge task at our hands. Because every religion has its own interpretation of what you know, the supernatural is. And if within the supernatural, we are trying to then segregate between good supernatural and bad supernatural, and then we're talking about bad supernatural actually harming women, then that in itself is a very huge discussion. So when we are trying to come up with legislation or laws or policies, uh, even if you are dealing with them in, in discussions like this, we are talking about you know, defining what this is, but that the whole exercise of defining which love in itself is so complicated because it's not only, like I said before, it's not only a problem in India, but it's a problem everywhere. But then every single community is viewing it differently. It's viewing it uh, through different classes. And then we are trying to have one law for the entire society, entire country. But then what would that actually look like? So I'm guessing that it wouldn't, it would have to be an evolving law. It would have to be something that keeps on changing with each and every case that comes up before the courts, no matter what the gravity of that particular case is. Because how do we understand these different, not so very legal terms is then going to then dictate how the law actually defines the entire scenario. So there is actually very less that the law can actually achieve. It's, it's more like an open field uh, and it's a very vast field for the law to cover it. And, they can, and the law can only do so much. A lot of it would be done by different other fields, perhaps sociology, psychology, a bit of history, religious studies. All of these then would have to pitch in in order to help the legal profession to tackle something which is so complex. And again, the complexity of it varies with the region where this is happening. So this is, again, this is what I believe is one of the most significant barriers when it comes to why we are still struggling with not having a central legislation. Because this, to begin with, this was never a problem for the law. I mean, the law would define things very uh, technically, perhaps in some places, maybe simply, but then it doesn't always cover what's actually happening. And, and this is one of the, the weakness in the law. And not just here in India, but elsewhere as well. It will take a very long time for the law to actually catch up to practices which are so very socially embedded in uh, every community. So, so yeah, so that's, uh, that's my point on this. I'm hearing today that the justice for victims would need to be an essential part of a national legislation. How... Could that, how, how could we reach that? So to essentially reach a sort of stage where we're able to rehabilitate and spread awareness for uh, such an act to stop acts of witch branding, to stop acts of furtherance of witchcraft beliefs. Again, we cannot go around it by not defining what witchcraft is, right? Because we need somewhere to draw the line. What where, where do you classify as witchcraft we have several religions in this country right and they we all have a right to profess and practice those religions in under our constitution but article 51a subclause h of the indian constitution makes it a fundamental duty for indian citizens to develop the scientific temper humanism and the spirit of in inquity and reform right and to to essentially make sure that there are these, there are these places, there are these mechanisms in place for the victims of such crimes. We need to go through it on a bi bi directional level. So we need to eradicate it from the grassroots, and we need to eradicate uh, anything that stops them from coming forward. Right? That means they should have a space, a safe space to go to, a safe space to sort of report the crime and retreat to. Right? We need 
again, as I mentioned, we need people from the a special department, if that's possible, to rehabilitate victims that have faced uh, ostracization of such sort, right? Because if we if we add them on to existing structures uh, that have been built for women and children that are in need for rehabilitation, it overburdens the system. It overburdens the system. It overburdens the mechanism for it, right? If we are to look at a central legislation, it would have to sort of look at it from the perspective of not just rehabilitation services, but also counseling for not just the physical harm that they have suffered, but also the mental agony that they have suffered at the hands of such uh, crime perpetrators, right? Witchcraft le legislation will have to encompass not just punitive measures, but also preventive and reformative rehabilitative aspects, such as education, community programs, and support for victims, right? So we're talking about a holistic approach that cannot be adequately addressed in our penal code, right, which deals with crimes. Now, when it comes to when it comes to rehabilitative services, of course, there's several that a person could be exposed to if if only the center and the state commissions sort of make room for that, right? We need trust uh, for our survivors. We need trust in such institutions, and such trust can only be done once existing cases are addressed properly. So. Odisha came out with, I believe, a composite action plan to prevent witchcraft. There was Project Garima, which dealt with uh, which dealt with the re rehabilitation of such victims, right? But Project Garima again was not very active, was not very proactive when it comes to follow up uh, of these victims, was not active in that sense that we needed it to be. These victims are coming from a variety of different backgrounds, right? We have people from an urban landscape. We have people from a rural landscape. Their needs need to be uh, sort of accommodated. And this is not this has not been adequately done, but there are projects that are being taken. Project Garima is one of the major things that are being, uh, that are part of such action plans, right? District magistrate is part of uh, our legal system, as a part of our state structure, uh, the, the law uh, and if a district magistrate himself, a DM, uh, undertakes forming a task force for the same and maintains a proactive approach, maybe more action could be undertook. This was also in the Action Aid report that uh, I'm referring to. Uh, this was published in 2021, I believe. And such such proactive measures need to be take need to be undertook, right, to effectively address the needs for the victims. And and this is also uh, some all of that which Ria said. The UN has been saying this since the early 2000s. So if you look at uh, the uh, the report by the UN committees, especially the committee on on CEDAW, uh, which is the committee on uh, elimination of discrimination against women, and several other uh, UN committees that that work around uh, the protection of human rights and that which focus a lot of uh, its work on, on gender and gender discrimination. They have been actually talking about a concept which is referred to as due diligence, and they have been trying to make use of it in order to understand different forms of gender-based violence. So they try and understand due diligence in, in two ways. One is individual due diligence, and another one is systemic due diligence. Now, individual due diligence on this how the UN understands it, Yes, it's basically just uh, you know a short term, uh, short term remedy that you can give to the victim. So if someone uh, is running away from their marital home because uh, they fear uh, uh, you know torture by by the husband, then the state uh, can provide them with immediate shelter, and that's a very you know a, a very small example of individual due diligence. So systemic due diligence is what we have been talking about, and. And this is the larger focus of the UN when it comes to uh, actively combating or preventing gender-based violence in whatever form it might exist in whichever part of the world. And this is wherein these uh, debates and other discussions around policymaking and uh, strengthening existing legislation and also making legislations where there is a vacuum 
uh, and all of this comes uh, within systemic due diligence. So this, again, covers things like uh, how do we define something, uh, whose opinion matters in that definition. Do we open up legislation to public consultations uh, at the initial stage itself so that uh, the victims, survivors, everyone who is working on the ground has a huge say in how this legislation is then going to be shaped right from the very beginning. Even if we are not able to do that, at least we should have options for public consultations. If we already have a drop that's ready with us, we should then open it up for suggestions and uh, contributions from civil society so that the government gets to know what they are lacking in and then they can re-strengthen uh, their draft and then it finally passes as a law. So all of these, although they might appear to be smaller, but very significant steps are then part of something that the UN calls a systemic due diligence. So uh, almost all the countries in the world have signed and ratified uh, almost each and every human rights instrument that there is. So they are then obligated under international human, uh, human rights law to not only understand due diligence in both individual and systemic, but then also make sure that it actually works on the ground. Uh, but, but this is what the UN uh, understands. So this is what is being said at the global level. But then whatever we have said so far today uh, here on this platform then goes on to, in, in some ways, challenge this belief. Not challenge wouldn't be the right word, but in some ways, it whatever we have discussed so far, in some ways causes friction with what the UN is trying to achieve through these human rights instruments. Because the problem on the ground isn't as simple as explaining it as individual due diligence, systemic due diligence. It's, it's a lot more complicated. And that's why it's, even if we have the best of explanations or definitions for the term witchcraft, it would still need to be an evolving definition. Because how we are understanding it perhaps would be different from how it's being understood or spoken about at the UN or elsewhere in a, in a larger global platform. So again, uh, it's good to know that these concepts or these ideas exist on the global platform. It, it's always helpful, but uh, but also in some ways, is we, we also have to be mindful of the fact that on the ground in our country, in, in within the country that do say one particular state, within that state, one smaller district, one smaller local community, how they would understand or take in this alien concept of due diligence might cause a lot of friction for the law and perhaps uh, what the victim is expecting out of the state in terms of providing them with protection and helping them out. So again, this is, this is always going to be a challenge that's always going to be there. But if we open up more to ideas that are not ours, but perhaps uh, global and try to imbibe them into our sort of very local specific problems, we might be able to reach to a solution much faster than we are at our current rate. So uh, be the draft bill that we were talking about, all the legislation that she pointed out earlier, all of all of them are in some ways struggling to get hold of the entire picture. Uh, it's, I mean, it was wrong for us to say that the law isn't working at the moment. It is to some extent that that. I mean, what both of us are trying to say to you is that a lot has to be done in terms of not only understanding what exactly is happening on the ground in terms of defining and understanding what these problems are, but what lies behind the curtain is much more important, much more complex to what we read about in newspapers or what we read in cases that do there are very few of them. So yes, in, in terms of barriers, in terms of what can be done is 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 all of this. I mean in some ways a lot more questions than there are answers to to the current problem. But it's important to ask these complex questions when you are dealing with something that's innately not very simple. So yeah, um, the more the complex the question is, it will make people think and think more as to what could be a simpler solution to this complex problem. And perhaps this would be the right way to go about solving something uh, which has been a problem for, uh, especially for women, not only in India, but around the world for centuries now.
Right. So, strict implementation that Dr. Amit spoke about, right, of existing laws is lacking. And state legislations that we do have currently are struggling with sort of the sort of the law enforcement aspect of it. So the development of rules with clear outline for the responsibility of officials at uh, every level, as Dr. Amit pointed out, at Gram Panchayat, Block and District level for rescue, immediate protection, medical care, counseling, legal aid and rehabilitation need to be worked out. So again, circling back to what are what makes a person vulnerable to such accusations, such witch branding has largely to do with the dissatisfaction of the community, right? Uh, and what we're dealing with here, essentially, is crop uh, problems like crop failure or a single woman who has inherited a lot of property, a widowed woman who has inherited property. Now, legal aid needs to be provided to them in order to secure their rights, to protect their rights. Rehabilitation for when they are not safe in their community any any longer. Right? That needs to be taken care of immediately. Medical care for victims who have suffered at the hands of such uh, heinous acts that have been committed. This ne- the process of law enforcement needs to be streamlined to really address the issue adequately. The Indian Penal Code currently does not adequately address this, does not, does not effectively uh, address this, which is, uh, I will circle back to the El Nakalim case in Kerala of uh, the double homicide that took place, uh, the human sacrifices that took place. Now, that charge sheet was 1,600 pages long and was filed 89 days post the arrest of the main accused. And in such a case, why was the charge sheet so long? I can point out several sections of the Bear Act, right? Uh, dealing with grievous hurt, dealing with wrongful confinement, dealing with murder, torture. But it does not sort of talk about the mental agony of it effectively. It does not talk about the stigmatization that happened. It does not talk about the negative impact it had on society at large for perpetrating such a belief forward, right? People live in these villages, people live in these towns, and it is shocking to us as a society to experience it, right, on a sociological level. So that needs to be addressed. Apart from that, guidelines need to be developed for good coordination between current state laws and the IPC that prosecute the suspects, right? So that is another thing I wanted to talk about. Yes. Thank you. That point on the societal damage was excellent um something we don't often consider is how society at large is impacted by these and obviously has a very negative impact on the image of women especially yes and kerala is one of our most progressive states in india and this case is from 2022 the one i'm talking about and the the fact that this happened in such a progressive state was shocking to everyone. Uh, we were sitting in class and our political professor, our political science professor, decided to sort of introduce us to the news of this. And all of us said, oh, Kerala, really? Uh, because in education, be it education, be it in women uh, empowerment related programs, Kerala has been the one that has really forwarded these things into practice. But when it comes to such acts, when it, everyone is vulnerable everywhere, as I said earlier, we're all on some level influenceable to such things of hope, fear, and desire. So wherever there is a lack of financial resources, infrastructure, wherever people are dissatisfied on such a systemic level, they will turn to other things as uh, a remedy, right? We have a Drug and Magic's uh, Remedies Act, right, uh, that sort of talks about false advertisements. We have people talking about magical remedies um, of impotence, of pregnancy-related issues, of a lot of several, you know, tuberculosis like diseases. And these medicines, these superstitious beliefs that, oh, perform this act, right, and then this will be fine. So even if we delve into the religious aspect of it, as I spoke about cultural relativism for a bit, We don't know where to draw the line except for it shouldn't cause harm to another person, right? It should not uh, go against our international sort of standards that we have agreed to 
as uh, Amit sir pointed out. We are supposed to put human rights at the forefront of this. We are supposed to put our we are supposed to put our constitution at the forefront of this. And so we have integrated child protection schemes. We have uh, several schemes that protect the already marginalized communities from further ostracization, from further discrimination. And in essence, such acts can be used as tools, witchcraft acts, witchcraft accusation acts can be used as tools for marginalization of those communities. And so this is a very systemic problem. But in essence, we're talking about the fact that everyone is vulnerable and a central legislation is key to spreading that awareness, is key to spreading that awareness of putting the victim at the center of the law, putting the victim as the focus of it, right? The marginalized communities do not deserve to be marginalized further. They deserve to be protected. They deserve to be uh, uplifted in society, right? And anything that is for such, a, a for, uh, anything that fosters such belief needs to be, needs to be taken, uh, uh, taken care of by the law. And we have legislations, we have bills that have been proposed. But another reason I think that this bill in particular, the 2022 bill I noticed, was the high penalty, right? 10 lakhs, up to 10 lakhs that are penalties listed here. And I noticed this back when I was doing my environmental law research. When it comes to wildlife protection, right? Poaching. If there is a high penalty, the judges are reluctant in giving a strict judgment. So we need to look at it from a holistic perspective. So that is another thing I would like to mention. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been so enlightening, this discussion. I really appreciate both of you. Thank you. Yeah. Mary Louise Bingham is back with A Minute with Mary. And which Hans announced a few weeks ago that we started to track cases in the U.S., where the vulnerable are victims of harmful practices due to the perpetrator's belief the victim is possessed by an evil spirit. We have an update on the case of three-year-old Arely Noemi Proctor of San Jose, California, who was believed by her mother, her uncle, and her grandfather to be possessed by a demon. All three performed a brutal exorcism on Arely, resulting in her death. On May 21st, Judge Hanley Chu decided there was enough evidence for this case to go to trial. All three defendants are being held without bail until their trial date is set before the court on August 14th. Finally, we are one step closer to justice for Sweet Arelli. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And thank you for listening to this episode of Witch Hunt. Please visit Witch Hunt on YouTube. Have a great today and a beautiful tomorrow. <laughs>